Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and this lecture will be on the adenocarcinoma spectrum. We're going to first look at the historical context of bronchioalveolar carcinoma and how it transitioned from BAC into the adenocarcinoma spectrum. Then we're going to touch on CT and pathologic features of adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions individually, and then take a look at to see how well that correlates with pathology and prognosis. So in brief, lung cancer has two main divisions, small cell and non-small cell. For non-small cell, the two most common types are small, uh, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma, with adenocarcinoma being the most common histologic type of lung cancer. So with adenocarcinoma, we saw that there was a subtype that appeared to be subsolid on CT and that grew more slowly. This was initially called bronchoalveolar carcinoma, which was defined in 1999 as tumor that demonstrated lipidic growth, that is tumor cells that are growing along alveolar septal walls without stromal or pleural invasion, that is a non-invasive lesion growing along alveolar septal walls. This was first proposed in 1999 and then retained by the WHO classification in 2004. At this point, they reported three subtypes, non-mucinous, mucinous, and mixed, with non-mucinous uh, cell type being the more common type arising from type two pneumocytes and cells, and the mucinous type arising from these tall columnar cells with this ex exuberant mucin production. However, what they found was that, you know, a lot of these tumors were mixed. They had features of lipidic growth, but then some had invasion invading into the lung parenchyma, into the pleura, and it created some confusion. So additional subtypes were then proposed by Noguchi in 1995 and then Tarasky in 2003. Obviously, this resulted in a lot of heterogeneity in the classification of, in diagnosis. So to address this issue, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, the American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society got together and decided to revise the classification for adenocarcinoma. This was done in 2011 and then discontinued the use of the term bronchioalveolar carcinoma, which was creating so much confusion. So there's four categories under the revised classification from 2011, pre-invasive lesions being atypical adenomatous hyperplasia and adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive lesions being minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, invasive lesions being invasive pulmonary adenocarcinoma, and then subtyping invasive adenocarcinoma based on the predominant invasive components, so acinar, papillary, micropapillary, solid, or lipidic, and then variants of invasive carcinoma, those being mainly invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. So these are the four categories that were put out in 2011 by this combined committee. So let's first talk about atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, or AAH. This represents a mild to moderate proliferation of atypical cells along septa and bronchioles without, without invasion. These are often found in association with lung cancers. So you can see them as single lesion or multiple lesions in the same lobe or different lobes in the setting of lung cancer. They're typically small in size, less than five millimeters, and rarely larger than one centimeter. They almost always will be subsolid on CT. Now the question becomes, do these lesions actually turn into cancer? And I think the jury's out on that. What we do know is that we see these in greater frequency in people that do have cancers. On CT, these appear as pure ground glass nodules. Uh, generally, they're very low in attenuation, so they're somewhat hazy and difficult to see. Kind of um, shown on this example on the right-hand side where there's a very vague ground glass nodule that would be very difficult to see without thin axial one millimeter slices. They tend to be very round and small in size typically less than five millimeters. Adenocarcinoma in situ or AIS is another type of lipidic growth of tumor where you have these atypical columnar cells without invasion. These are typically five to 20 millimeters in size, though they can measure up to three centimeters. So on CT, these are typically pure ground glass nodules. They're generally easier to see than atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. That is, they're a little bit denser. Their size is also bigger. So on like kind of the half centimeter to two centimeter range, up to three centimeters. They're usually again, round and fairly homogeneous. Again, there's some exceptions to these rules, but by and large, that these are typically pure ground glass nodules, less than two centimeters that are round and fairly homogeneous as shown on the example on the right. So like the previous tumors, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma will also demonstrate lipidic growth, with a small, but it has a small invasive component, the invasive component here measuring less than five millimeters. On CT, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma is part solid appearing with a solid component measuring less than five millimeters and the ground glass component being up to three centimeters in size. That is, it is a part solid pulmonary nodule, both solid and ground glass. Some additional features that you can see with the ground glass component is that they tend to be slightly more angular or spiculated. You may see intermixed cystic change, which is known as pseudocavitation, and you may even see air bronchograms, some differentiating features from pre-invasive lesions. 
When reporting these lesions, you want to report both the composite size, that is the largest size of the total lesion, as well as the solid component. On the right-hand image, we can see that there's a part solid nodule, with this ground glass component demonstrating some small intermixed cystic lucencies, having angular margins with a little bit of pleural tagging, and kind of a thin, centrally oriented solid component. This represented a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. This is an example of a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. The same lesion on both images A, B, and C is a part solid pulmonary nodule. On image B, you can see it measured in its composite dimension, that is its largest composite transverse dimension measuring 18 millimeters. So you'd report this as being an 18 millimeter composite dimension lesion with the solid component being measured on image C measuring four millimeters. So that is, you'd say that there's a part solid nodule measuring 18 millimeters in composite dimension with the solid component measuring four millimeters. So the only difference really between an invasive and a minimally invasive is the size of the invasive focus. For invasive pulmonary, pathologists use greater than five millimeters of an invasive component to differentiate the two. Once they define it as being an invasive lesion, then they want to try to characterize the invasive component. The invasive components can be broken down into acinary, papillary, micropapillary, solid, and lipidic. These can be mixed uh, histologic cell types, so containing both acinar and papillary elements. What we do know is that the micropapillary element actually carries the worst prognosis, so this is not going to affect stage. These are all staged the exact same way. But if you have the micropapillary predominant uh, cell type, these are associated with worse outcomes, that is, a greater risk for metastatic disease. Another uh, source of confusion is the lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma. This creates con some confusion as all these uh, cell types will have lipidic features. That is, they're going to have a component that demonstrates lipidic growth as well as an invasive component. But they use the term lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma when the majority of the lesion is lipidic with a smaller invasive component. That is, um, the invasive component is not the predominant uh, feature of the lesion, although the invasive component is greater than five millimeters. So on CT, we see similar things to minimally invasive, except a solid component will measure greater than five millimeters. These again can be parts solid, that is both ground glass and solid. They could be largely solid, so greater than 50%. And that actually, that ratio there does correspond with a higher degree of invasiveness on um, pathology, or they could be purely solid. Uh, these can even appear speculated. On the right-hand image, we have a part solid nodule. So you could see that the majority of the lesion actually does appear to be ground glass. So we can see the ground glass component all out here. So this is all the ground glass component. But then centrally, we could obviously make out that there is this solid, bizarrely shaped component that's in, represented an invasive component of the lesion. In addition, note how there is some intermixed cystic lucencies. These represent areas of pseudocavitation. Also note how the borders, right? The borders appear somewhat angular and speculated in comparison to the pre-invasive lesions where the borders appear a little bit more round and uniform. Here's another invasive pulmonary adenocarcinoma where you can see that there's a part solid pulmonary nodule. So you can see all the ground glass in the periphery here. And then centrally, there's a larger solid component. This is a lesion that demonstrates you know, greater than 50% of it being consolidated versus ground glass. This has a much higher likelihood of being invasive. Again, note the angular borders. There's some air bronchograms and intermixed cystic change. All these are features more associated with uh, invasive lesions. Also note how there's some pleural tagging here. Pleural tagging is another finding that's been reported to be more frequently seen in invasive lesions. Here's three CT images separated by uh, yearly scans. And you can see that initially we have a very vague ground glass nodule down here. On subsequent imaging, we could see that the ground glass nodule has not only slightly increased in size, but is overall increased in density. So we could see that there's a change between not, not only size, but also visible density. On subsequent imaging, we can see that the ground glass nodule has again increased in size, however, has also developed a, so a part solid component. This lesion then moved from initially being an adenocarcinoma in situ, potentially to a minimally invasive lesion, now to a frankly invasive pulmonary adenocarcinoma containing both solid and ground glass components. So let's try to tie these together with the CT features. So we have two pathologic components. There's the lipidic component. This is the portion of the tumor that's growing along the alveolar septal walls. This represents the ground glass component that we see on CT. And then we have the invasive component. The invasive component is typically the solid component. And then again, the solid component is really what drives management and prognosis. This is the most important marker for whether or not the disease is gonna be metastatic and what the patient's prognosis is actually gonna be. So let's try to summarize everything that we just talked about. So we have four subsolid nodules here. 
we first want to try to define what is a pre-invasive lesion versus an invasive lesion. So the pre-invasive lesions are typically going to be purely ground glass, whereas the invasive lesions typically are going to demonstrate part solid components, and there are some exceptions to these rules that we're going to go over. The first pre-invasive lesion is atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, which is going to measure less than 5 millimeters on CT imaging. Again, this is going to be pure ground glass, very low density, somewhat difficult to see. They're often rounded in, and very uniform internally without internal cystic changes. Adenocarcinoma in situ, on the other hand, um, is going to be larger in size, so up to 2 centimeters, usually a maximum size, no greater than 3 centimeters. It's going to be a little bit denser and larger and easier to see than atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. It also appears rounded and somewhat more uniform. Again, there's some exceptions to that rule, but in general, adenocarcinoma in situ are going to be rounded, fairly uniform lesions. Now moving into the evasive realm, now we're talking about that these lesions are part solid. That is, they're both ground glass and have a solid component, the solid component representing the white nodule seen centrally. When we differentiate minimally invasive from invasive lesions, we want to talk about the size of the solid component, right? So we're looking at the size of the solid component. A size less than five millimeters is defined as being minimally invasive. Again, when we compare the overall size, the composite dimension, these lesions tend to be larger than pre-invasive lesions. So larger than pre-invasive lesions. Invasive pulmonary adenocarcinomas, on the other hand, again, are going to be part solid. And when we look at the solid component, the solid component is going to be measuring greater than five millimeters and may demonstrate a ratio of ground glass consolidation, where the consolidation or solid component makes up greater than 50% of it. And then we talk about these internal solid components, those being things like acin or solid, micropapillary, papillary. In addition, when we compare the ground glass components of invasive lesions to pre-invasive lesions, we often note some differences. So for one, we could see some internal heterogeneity of the ground glass components for invasive lesions versus pre-invasive. We also may see internal cystic change represented by these black circles um, that's more commonly seen with invasive lesions. The borders may appear more angular or spiculated, and that sometimes we could see these air bronchograms running through it. Another feature that we may see is pleural tagging. So these features of the ground glass components, again, are more, are more commonly seen in the setting of invasive lesions. So how does this correlate with pathology? It actually correlates pretty well. Uh, both the ground glass component representing lipidic growth and the solid component representing um, the invasive component. Um, more importantly is we want to try to identify those lesions that are invasive and then therefore likely more likely to metastasize. So um, predictors of invasiveness and likely to metastasize are based both on the largest composite size. So even if they're just purely ground glass, when you start getting lesions above the 12 or 15 millimeter range, the likelihood of those lesions, even if purely ground glass, being invasive goes up. In addition, the larger the solid components, so um, you know, with nine millimeters showing 100% uh, specificity for um, diagnosing invasive adenocarcinomas, the larger the solid component, the more likely it is to be invasive. And then also this ratio where we can see the solid or consolidated portion to ground glass being greater than 50%, also associated with a greater likelihood of invasion. Okay, so let's talk about some of the limitations regarding these part solid pulmonary nodules. One of the first and kind of most uh, fundamental is, you know, how do we correctly identify what the solid component actually is? And um, that can be, even though it seems like a pretty basic concept, sometimes it can be kind of challenging. So on the right hand image, we can see that there is this uh, subsolid pulmonary nodule with a ground glass component, intermixed cystic change, some angular margins. We are concerned that this is potentially an invasive lesion. We do note that there is a more solid appearing component out on the lateral edge of it. However, the solid component appears you know, somewhat ill-defined and fuzzy. How do you want to measure this lesion? And this has been addressed by using certain window width and window levels with different studies showing different numbers. But there is some literature out there that try to help us more correctly identify how big the solid component actually is. In addition, when it comes to measuring these lesions, there's some variability as well. Uh, and some studies have looked at you know, intra and inter-observer uh, agreements with these measurements, given the radiologist the same study to remeasure the lesion, as well as another radiologist during the same day to measure it. And what they found is that these measurements can vary up to 20% for the solid lesions with differences up to two mil plus or minus two millimeters. And you can see that that can make you know, kind of a big difference. If you have a three millimeter solid component versus a five millimeter solid component, that's the difference between um, in a, you know, minimally invasive lesion versus an invasive lesion. Uh, in addition, what we do know um, from pathologic studies is that we do tend to overestimate the size of the solid lesion. We overestimate the size of the solid lesion up to 20%. Um, in addition, the solid lesion doesn't necessarily always correspond to an invasive component. Um, you know, we see solid components in um, uh, 
adenocarcinoma in situ, uh, even though they're not invasive lesions. And that's because these lesions can contain areas of atelectasis or fibrosis, which we can mistake for an invasive lesion. So not all part solid pulmonary nodules um, are actually invasive lesions. That's an important concept to remember. And similarly, not, while not all part solid pulmonary nodules are definitively invasive, not all pure ground glass nodules are non-invasive. So on the right-hand side, we can see that there's a pure ground glass nodule. The borders appear angular. There's intramic cystic change, bronchiectasis, uh, uh, air bronchograms rather, as well as some areas of pleural tagging. All those features taken together increase the likelihood of this being an invasive lesion, even though there's not cl clearly identifiable solid components. And this was actually a case of an invasive uh, pulmonary adenocarcinoma, acinar features. So not all pure ground glass nodules are pre-invasive, and there are some features that we can use to help us identify or separate out those that are purely ground glass being invasive versus those that are purely ground glass and being non-invasive. Let's briefly talk about multicentric or multifocal adenocarcinoma. This is where we have multiple different types of adenocarcinomas within the lung. The first thing to recognize is that this is actually not uncommon. A significant uh, minority of people that have adenocarcinomas in their lung will have additional adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions. And these lesions will typically vary in size, degree of invasiveness, the amount of solid or ground glass components. Uh, we want to follow these lesions and treat the lesions based on the most worrisome one. On the right-hand image, we can see that there in blue are several ground glass nodules, purely ground glass nodules, probably representing pre-invasive lesions. And in red, we can see that there's a part solid nodule with an ill-defined solid component representing a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. This is what we'd say is a multicentric or multifocal adenocarcinoma. Let's briefly talk about invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. These again arise from tall columnar cells. They produce this abundant mucin. They will demonstrate lipidic and invasive patterns similar to um, the non-mucinous uh, types of adenocarcinoma. But again, they're really characterized by the different cell type, some different stains that they could do pathologically, as well as this abundant mucin production. In addition, these tend to be multifocal and when multifocal, often multilobar. So the CT appearance of these lesions can actually vary from a discrete nodule to multiple nodules, but one of the um, common features that we see with invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma is that it could actually resemble a pneumonia. And these things can be pretty confusing when you first start looking at them. What do we see on CT? We see areas of ground glass opacity and consolidation. When we see them, they tend to be uh, multifocal and multilobar. And this is an example of one on the right, where we can see that there's a lobar area of ground glass opacity with some intermixed consolidation. When we look at the other lung, we can see that there are some mass-like areas or nodular areas of consolidation in ground glass in the contralateral lung. This represented an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma carcinoma. This is one of the reasons why it's important to make sure you get follow-up imaging in people that have an area of consolidation in their lung, particularly if they don't have any symptoms to correspond to a pneumonia. Here's another example of an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma where we can see that there's multi-lobar areas of ground glass opacity and consolidation. There's even intermixed air bronchograms. You know, this appearance on the left-hand side over here would be pretty difficult to differentiate from um, a pneumonia, a multi-lobar pneumonia. In the contralateral lung, we can see that there's, again, areas of consolidation in ground glass and even some subsolid pulmonary nodules, all of this representing invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. So in conclusion, we want to try to apply the 2011 revised classification of adenocarcinomas that is no longer use the term bronchioalveolar carcinoma, and then try to decide whether or not we're looking at pre-invasive and invasive lesions. We, we recognize some salient features on CT to help us try to characterize these lesions, that is the size, whether they're purely ground glass or part solid, but then we also recognize that there are some limitations on CT. That is, there's overlap between these types of lesions. We saw that some parts solid pulmonary nodules could actually be pre-invasive and that purely grown glass nodules can actually be invasive. And that there were some features that we looked at such as internal heterogeneity of the ground glass component, <clears throat> component with cystic change in air bronchograms, uh, angular margins, and pleural tagging, as well as the consolidation to ground glass ratio that increases the likelihood of the lesion actually being an invasive or uh, minimally invasive lesion. Thanks for listening, and if there's any questions, please feel free to email me at scott.simpson at uphs.upenn.edu.